we uh, welcome you in this final afternoon session of the CTBUH uh, Mumbai Conference entitled Advances in Structural Engineering uh, Part 2. The next presentation is entitled Performance-Based Design of Tall Buildings and will be given by uh, Satish Jain of SJC here in Mumbai and Joe uh, Maffei of Rutherford Shakin uh, in San Francisco. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Satish Jain with uh, Satish Jain and Company over here in Mumbai. <clears throat> and uh, myself and uh, Dr. Joe Maffei here are going to talk about performance-based design of uh, tall buildings. But, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that really struck me uh, early on in the conference, during the first day, somebody said, one of the speakers said that we are living in very exciting times here. Well, yes, we are. Mumbai is changing construction-wise. That's renaissance. And we are also having this conference in the Renaissance Hotel and Convention Center. But that's a coincidence that I thought was very unique, you know. Mumbai is undergoing huge change, high-rise buildings, and uh, with respect to that, we are in exciting times. So, <clears throat> and... Today's track, this morning, I mean, you might have seen a lot of high-rise buildings, a lot of com complex structures, you know, being thrown up on the slides up there. But one thing that you would have seen and interpreted after all those talks is that the structural system or the load path is extremely simple. That is what we have to remember. However complex the geometry, however complex the system looks, in the minds of our structure, in, in the structural minds, the load path has to be simple. The structural system has to put the loads down. We as engineers have to control how the building behaves and not let the building behave itself during an, uh, during an event like an earthquake or a, you know, hurricane or cyclone. Today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about performance-based design. Uh, you know, what it is, what it actually means, why people should not be scared of it. I've heard a lot of engineers saying, what it is, you know, I can't do this uh, without even knowing what it is. So just something to bear in mind. And then uh, Joe will come over here uh, describing in detail, you know, all the behavioral aspects that should make you much more comfortable dealing with performance-based design when you get into it in the future if you're not already. So uh, again, you know, just some quick pictures up there I got off the web, you know. Mumbai skyline is changing. A lot of big towers coming up and a whole lot planned, and everybody's here for it. But, <clears throat> and the issues that are coming up with respect to that, high real estate prices, you know, need for efficient and economic and safe earthquake design. Uh, <clears throat> Kerry was just talking about the whole codal issues and, you know, the codes getting bigger. Here it is, you know, the codes, especially, I mean, when I see uh, codes over here in India or even elsewhere, you see that the codes have been designed or basically have been put together so that you follow some rules, some thumb rules to design some of the buildings. Of course, a lot of effort goes into that, but those, uh, those kind of codes, the codes are written practically for regular kind of buildings. What happens when you're getting into some complex geometry or something that, you know, gets out of your hand? The code's not going to help you. Plus, when you're going to high-rise buildings, things are getting so expensive. Land is expensive, first of all. When you're talking of an 80, 100-story tower, that tower becomes really expensive. So how do you get, you know, uh, efficient system? Good structural system, good constructability practices, those are really good. But finally, it also boils down is what rules are you following for detailing? How are you designing? And that's where performance-based design can really help you quite a bit in, <clears throat> in you as an engineer understanding where the links, uh, where the weak points in the structures are or where you want to put the weak points and then specifically detailing those weak points so that you are putting what you require in the right areas. There are a lot of examples of building where the building is over-designed quite a bit, but you don't have the detailing or the rebar in the places where you actually need them. So here is a tool, performance-based seismic design is a tool wherein you can control your building very well, knowing <coughs> exactly what you're doing. Uh, let me take you to this slide. I mean, this is one of the simplest slides that you would see a lot of places. But here it is. When you're doing seismic design, you have a lot of choices. One of them is to have no damage at all. 
I mean, if you look at the topmost one, where I say operational level, that's where you're designing the structure to be at an elastic level. Come on, most of us who are designing buildings, if we are going to design buildings at an elastic level, no choice. I don't think uh, we are going to get the jobs. You know, buildings become extremely expensive. <clears throat> but it is required in cases of like nuclear power containments, etc., where you want the plants to be um, operational. So you have to go for that kind of a design. But <clears throat> you also have a choice. Let's say you are going to design, you're going to allow some damage in the structure, but you're going to say, well, I will allow damage in the structure, but specific locations of damage in the structure, I will let the structure stretch out, but not let it collapse. That's where all the other lines in the chart below goes. So you design for the force you desire. You put in the structural system you desire. You let the structure uh, or the, you know, uh, basically the structure stretch out as much as you want, but to the choice may be made by you or by the client. Here is a quick example of uh, <clears throat> what it is. I mean, the top left corner is a very low earthquake, uh, or let's say the 50% in 50 years is a very, very weak earthquake. And if you go down the chart, the 2% in 50 years is a very high earthquake force. So <clears throat> this matrix or this chart basically tells you that you as an engineer have a wide variety of choice, whether you want to design the structure uh, at a level M to the bottom left to be operational, very, very heavy structure, or you can take it all the way to collapse but not let it collapse and design for a very heavy, or, you know, a light structure, I mean, for a very heavy earthquake. And at the same time, for that tall building, you come up with a 50% in 50 years earthquake right at the top left, and check that it's operational and it's serviceable in a very, very light earthquake. So you're <clears throat> making a choice over there and making sure that in low earthquakes, the building is serviceable, you don't get huge cracks, and in high earthquake, you're designing it so that it does not collapse. So there are various choices that are available for you, and you can make a choice. You can put this chart in front of your client and basically point out and say, hey, we've got all these choices, let's see where the budget is, and let's decide what we exactly want to do and what you exa exactly want out of your building. <clears throat> Very quickly, going to performance-based design, uh, <clears throat> you are going to have choices. Where do you really start? I mean, <clears throat> I just said, you know, codes are made for regular buildings, not for complex buildings. But at the same time, I would put down this thing that the code is one thing which will give you some basic guidelines to at least start. It's a great start, starting place, if not, you know, for your final design, but it's a great starting place. So you can design per your response spectrum, et cetera, but then you can go ahead and do a very sophisticated nonlinear time history dynamic analysis or any other kind of nonlinear analysis that may suit your project to finalize your design and come up with an optimized and efficient structure. That's what you finally need. So that's what this chart is. I mean, you can have a two-step process over there. And uh, this slide basically shows a variety of, uh, you know, nonlinear techniques that are available. And uh, <clears throat> one of them is going to be suitable for your project. And it doesn't have to be one, doesn't have to be better than the uh, other. But of course, you know, some are reliable, more reliable than the other. But then, based on a certain project, you would be able to either choose a pushover analysis or some kind of a time history analysis, 3D, three-dimensional time history analysis, or even, you know, a single, um, uh, basically, a single mode uh, time history or single mode pushover analysis, if you may. So there are various choices available for you. With this, what I'll do is I'll give it out to Joe, and uh, he will go ahead and show you some exciting things that, uh, you know, how buildings behave and show you some good things up there. Uh, th thank you, Satish, and thanks, Chuck. I um, appreciate the opportunity to be here, and uh, one of the presentations I really enjoyed, which I think everyone did, was this morning's talk by uh, Alain Robert, the French Spider-Man who climbs tall buildings, and uh, a disconcerting thing happened to me because uh, just earlier today I saw him taking the elevator. Um, and. <laughs> While, uh, actually, I think he was put on the first floor. I'm not sure if the hotel had reasons for that or not. So while I was disillusioned to see Spider-Man 
take the elevator, I think it's a similar sense of disillusionment that has driven much of performance-based design. And in fact, it's disillusionment with the building codes. And Kerry gave an example of how the volume of requirements keeps increasing and increasing. Uh, and the ironic thing is the applicability of requirements to what we're trying to do with advanced designs and innovative ideas uh, becomes more and more strained. So it is the difficulty of making sense of building code requirements that's starting to drive performance-based design. Um, and what performance-based design is about, really, is stepping back and seeking the truth. What is the real behavior that you're trying to achieve with your structure? And in San Francisco, we're talking almost exclusively about seismic behavior. Even in quite tall buildings, there's a lot that's governed by seismic behavior rather than wind. And I'm going to refer here in a couple of examples to one of the more popular styles of building uh, on the west coast of the United States. This is an example building in Seattle, Washington. Uh, very similar buildings have been built in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia, and Canada, in Los Angeles, in San Francisco, in other western U.S. cities with high seismicity. This is a concrete core wall construction, and the concrete core itself is the principal lateral force resisting system. Uh, gravity systems, in this case, are, are steel construction surrounding the concrete core, uh, which does have a role and does have an effect that should be considered, but there is no uh, intended moment frame for the upper levels of this building. And the seismic force resisting system in the weaker direction of the core is a series of solid walls. And then in the uh, stronger direction of the core, there's uh, elevator openings here, openings into the elevator lobby, and so that's a coupled wall system. And so I'll talk a little bit about uh, what we can learn about that type of concrete wall behavior and what we can rely on. Uh, and here's a very good laboratory experiment that'll give us some insight. It's a seven-story full-scale test taking place at the outdoor shake table at the University of California, San Diego. Uh, now, the test specimen is quite smaller than the actual typical high-rise concrete core. I converted all the dimensions here to meters only to find out that here in India, when everybody speaks, they keep talking in feet and inches. But anyway, you, you see the dimensions there. Um, in fact, although the test specimen is quite small, if you analyze some of the most important parameters, such as the axial load ratio and the reinforcement ratio, it's quite representative of concrete core behavior. And so now there's a, a bit of a movie here. This structure was subjected to a number of earthquakes, uh, all in the span not of uh, thousands of years like the lighthouse at Alexandria, but in the span of a couple of months. And this is the biggest one. You're going to see a couple of big velocity pulses here shaking the structure. And the top of that structure went to about 40 centimeters of displacement, 16 inches, which is 2% of the height of the structure. So 2% average roof drift is really sort of this maximum considered uh, earthquake motion that would come along once every, say, 1,000, 2,000 years. And the structure actually performed very well, uh, both in terms of obviously not collapsing, but also in terms of the amount of damage and the amount of necessary repair. So this is a close-up of the lower left portion of the structure, um, and you'll see the behavior for the same ground motion here, and you'll see what's happening in the plastic hinge zone. So what you're looking at are flexural cracks that open and close uh, during the ground motion. You can see there was a bit of spalling there. If you like, I can show it to you again. I think I can. So remember, this is a structure responding to the maximum uh, considered level of, of earthquake motion, something that might come along every 1,000 or 2,000 years, although it could come along tomorrow. Um, the vertical reinforcement in this plastic hinge zone is actually being strained to a local ductility level 12 times its yield strain. But as you can see, the only repair really necessary was some cosmetic patching of cracks and... Um, 
some repair of the spalled concrete there. Uh, the expected behavior for subsequent earthquakes uh, would be equally as good, at least in my opinion. Uh, perhaps if you gave it 22 earthquakes, that might be a magic number that does, does some damage. Uh, so the secret to this good seismic performance is really flexurally governed behavior of the concrete section. And as structural engineers, we like to look at force versus displacement to create energy dissipation, similar to what Kerry was talking about with friction. The area inside these loops is the dissipated earthquake energy. So this is another test of a flexurally governed wall. And in wind design, you know, we're trying to work within this limit of where we meet, uh, reach the maximum strength and, and sort of stay in here for wind design. For earthquake design, we realize that we can't always achieve that, that we need to go beyond the maximum strength of the structure. We need to force the structure or, or be able to accommodate displacements beyond this yield displacement here. And you can see with flexure governed behavior, we can go eight or 10 times beyond the yield displacement without having a degradation in strength. And this is the property of ductility. This is the property that will allow our buildings to survive strong earthquakes. Uh, one of the other things, besides just uh, defining how we want the structure to perform, we want to define where we want this kind of performance to take place in the structure. This is an example from the Northridge earthquake where reinforcement was cut off over the height of the structure and the plastic hinging actually occurred halfway up the wall rather than at the base of the wall, which is more desirable. It's better to have most of that nonlinear behavior happen at the base of the wall. And the reason is that the earthquake is going to impose a displacement demand on your building. And if you can get the building to accept that roof displacement demand with as much of a distribution of deformation over height, that's, that's uh, an objective that you should try to achieve when defining the mechanism for earthquake response. So the thing that we really want to avoid in concrete structures is shear failure. And here's an example from the 1964 Alaska earthquake of shear failure in the walls. It's a brittle failure. You're not able to displace the structure beyond its uh, strength limit without having a degradation of strength. And that degradation of strength can lead to uh, larger displacements and possibly lead to collapse. Another example of shear failure on the left is from the 1995 Kobe earthquake. On the right is a test specimen uh, from New Zealand. Uh, the, the specimen on the right is actually a flexure shear combined failure which uh, has a, a, an initial behavior with some flexural cracking and a, maybe a limited amount of ductility. So you can see, if you look closely, some flexural cracking here. But with a little bit of cycling and degradation of the concrete, it's a shear failure that it takes place. And now with a flexural behaving member, you saw that flexural cracks will close again on the reversal of earthquake cycles. Shear cracks will not do that. Okay, so the big shear crack that you see there is caused by leftward motion at the top. When you reverse the motion back in the other direction, you don't actually close that crack. What do you do? You open new cracks in the opposite inclination. Here's another example of shear failure without any real ductility capacity there. This is from 1985 uh, Mexico City earthquake. And yet another thing that's undesirable about shear failures is that they typically correspond to a concentration of the nonlinear deformation over a few stories, over a limited height. And as you get to taller and taller buildings, this becomes a bigger issue. So uh, on the flexure governed uh, response on the left, we're taking the displacement demand that the earthquake is imposing and we're able to distribute it with deformation over the height of the building and the image of a shear failure on the right is one of concentrated deformation. So what we're talking about and some of the things that Satish emphasized really come under the umbrella of capacity design. Capacity design is the philosophy uh, principally developed in New Zealand of the engineer designing both how and where nonlinear response should occur in a structure. So the how is what kind of failure mode do you want? What kind of behavior mode do you want? Uh, flexural behavior, do you want shear behavior? If you have a steel structure, do you want uh, gross section yielding, which is probably ductile, as opposed to, say, local buckling or uh, net section fracture, uh, connection failure, and so forth? 
Um, so for a cantilever wall here, the desired mechanism is a flexural plastic hinge at the base. For a coupled wall, we want to have plastic hinging in the coupling beams, which should be having ductile reinforcement, for example, diagonal reinforcement patterns, as well as a uh, flexural plastic hinge at the base. The dual systems where we have walls plus moment frames are pretty tricky. Um, and building codes do not correctly address this. Well, they don't correctly address the cantilever or coupled walls either, to tell you the truth. But in a dual system, you know, the mechanism uh, is really dependent on the wall and how the wall behaves. So the figure on the left actually shows some columns hinging. You can see these columns hinging here. And these might be weaker than the beams, and therefore those columns are hinging. But this wall has the overall strength to, to force this distribution of nonlinear deformation over the height of the building. If you allow the wall to fail in shear, and, and it's, it, it's very susceptible to failing in shear because of the frame-wall interaction, you'll get this concentration of deformation. And the wall shear failure will actually force this localized failure of either the gravity system or of the moment frame. So one of the other things I'd like to touch on, which I think is a key part of performance-based design, is a direct reliance on research. And in some cases, there are tall buildings where project-specific research is carried out. So I just want to give you sort of a quick example of how we've been looking at this in our role as peer reviewers of tall buildings. And, and I'll talk a little bit about peer review to finish up. But one of the things we always want uh, the engineer of record to do is justify their assumptions. And one of the important assumptions in concrete buildings is what is the appropriate stiffness. So at Rutherford and Chikine, we took the relatively ordinary ETABS model, linear ETABS model, and we tested it against this test structure. And the video I showed you is of the big fat loop of the really maximum level earthquake. But we said, how well are we going to model these smaller earthquakes which this structure was subjected to, which are really within the linear range of behavior? And so if you just open one of these volumes of building codes that Kerry was talking about and look at the recommendations they give, you put that in your analysis model, you don't have the benefit of an experiment, you're going to greatly underpredict the maximum displacement, you're going to get the dynamic properties wrong, etc. With some trial and error, we found that we could uh, very closely match the test behavior for this uh, nearly linear response, but to do so, we used uh, much more flexible uh, properties for the concrete section. So about 20% of gross section properties is appropriate for a lightly reinforced concrete section subject to earthquake loads. Um, and and that's, that's a truth. A number of researchers have said that for a long time. Concrete, reinforced concrete is not as stiff as you think it is. Probably no matter how stiff you think it is, uh, I don't really know, but it's probably not that stiff. Uh, so a lot of this performance-based design recommendations have been collected into a document that I had a leading role in uh, in Northern California here. We use the term non-prescriptive seismic design because it's a little bit more precise than performance-based design, which is bandied about quite loosely. Uh, and, you know, non-prescriptive design really means that you're taking exception to some of the prescriptive rules of the building code that are not applicable. And the real challenge in providing a guideline like this is not to just write new prescriptive rules that somebody else later on is going to have to take exception to. So this is really meant to be a general guideline. There are similar publications uh, by the Council for Tall Buildings, for example, that I think do a pretty good job of not just replacing inapplicable prescriptive provisions with new somewhat arbitrary prov provisions. And so one of the things that, that's part of this process that's recommended in that document is seismic review. And I've just got four quick slides on, on seismic peer review. Uh, it's different than structural plan review, you know, which is carried out by the building authority and it really is a review of completed documents and the objective of that review is do you meet the code. Peer review, you want to start it early. You really want to focus on the assumptions that the engineer of record is making. You want to review concepts, methods, and assumptions. Often you're only focused on seismic design because that's the part of the design that's non-prescriptive. Uh, and then the other difference is, um, as a peer reviewer, we don't have really any authority other than the authority to write a letter. And that's a letter that gives our professional opinion 
on the seismic design, on what its resulting performance will be, whether that performance is consistent with the stated intentions of the building code or other project-specific criteria. Uh, in the United States, we do a lot of these peer reviews working for the building authority. Uh, we've also done them working for the owner when the owner wants that extra measure of confidence in the design. Uh, and here's an example of another project happens to be in Seattle where one of the things we'll do is we'll try and take a somewhat independent look. If we can do it uh, feasibly and, and efficiently, we'll maybe carry out our own simple analysis of the structure. And we did this one. Um, I was a little nervous because I'd never done that. We were using different software than the engineer of record, which is KPFF in their Seattle office. But we found actually very similar performance under the same ground motions when you took our analysis model in PERFORM compared to their analysis model in SAP. So this is response. There's two lines here. I don't know if you can see them both, but they're almost overlaying each other when you su subject both analysis models to the same ground motion. So just to summarize this performance-based seismic design or non-prescriptive seismic design, I think it can be a win-win situation. It can lead to both better performance and a more economical building. And it's really a process of basing your design more directly on sound research and sound principles. And there needs to be a process of substantiating that design. Often that's done with uh, peer review using expert reviewers. Thank you. Thank you.